Bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless it. Hi, thanks for tuning in to Armor of God. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us, and hopefully you'll learn a lot from what we've put together for you here. Well, for this video, I'd like to share something from Father Joseph Iannuzzi again, and as you know, he is one of the most frequently featured exorcist priests here on this channel. And in fact, a few months back, some of you have submitted questions for Father Iannuzzi to answer, and one of the most popular questions submitted there was about the extraterrestrial life, which we have covered in a video before. And in one particular podcast with a group of Australians, he was asked this very interesting question. How is it possible that the indigenous people of Australia have been here thousands of years, while the Bible only relates Adam's been here for only 6,000? Before I share the clip, though, some of you commented and asked why I don't share the full length of these interviews. Well, for one, there are links to all the interviews and lectures in the description box. And secondly, my approach is to only share selected highlights of the said interviews and lectures. And so anyway, here's Father Yanuzi's answer to the question earlier. How is it considered truth that the indigenous people of Australia have been here thousands of years? And what proof is there of this? Okay, that before man was here, there were other rational beings here for a long, long time, but they were not human. This is not a matter of opinion. This is a matter of archeological geological, experiential fact that's documented even by governments throughout the world. And it's also corroborated by approved prophetic literature. And um, the list goes on and on. I'll give you two quick examples. Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel. After Cain killed Abel, God put a mark on Cain so that no one would harm him. Well, if there was nobody here, why would Cain need a mark at all? Unless there were others here that could harm him. Okay. And in the book of Genesis, it talks about these beings that fell from above, that had relations with the daughters of men, contaminating the human DNA with their DNA. When we think of what Father Yanuzi is saying here, it will bring up a lot of questions. For example, how does original sin relate to these beings and how does it influence them? How does the one incarnation of Christ impact them? How does the sacramentology of our faith influence or relate to them? Do they know the three divine persons? Do they have revelations? Do they have a revealed word of God? Where are they from? When did they come here? What is their purpose? Are they made in God's image and likeness? Even Padre Pio of Pietrelcina stated more than once, once it was recorded by a monk, that these beings exist on other planets. Padre Pio, in a book that has the church's seals of approval, said this. But he also related to others with, that had not been written down the same thing in different words. Okay, And even the Vatican spokesperson, Monsignor Corrado Balducci, demonologist, exorcist, also has had television interviews in which he talks about the reality of these beings. And he holds up in one of his interviews in Italian on Italian television, representing the Vatican, he representing the Vatican, a photograph taken of spacecraft forming the cross, going across the sky, acknowledging Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's a completely different issue, but that's an answer to this question. How is it possible that the indigenous people of Australia have been here thousands of years while the Bible only relates Adam's been here for only 6,000? Well, those that preceded Adam were not human. Adam was the first human being. This is a doctrine of faith. It's contained in a work, an encyclical by Pope Pius XII, entitled On the Human Race in Latin, Humani Genetis, in which he states that the first two individuals of the entire human race were Adam and Eve. So that necessarily means those who preceded him were not human. They were rational. We know this from pictographs, etchings in caves, cuneiform writings, hieroglyphic writings. We know this. Well, the hieroglyphics came after, so did the cuneiform. But these pictographs preceded Adam and Eve. 
and other forms of uh, um, writing. This question says, basically 6,000 years since Adam and Eve are here as stated in the book of, Revel of, of heaven. How is it possible that the indigenous people could have been here thousands of years? Well, they weren't here before Adam and Eve, but there were other beings here before Adam and Eve. Now, here's another question for you with regard to not just indigenous people of Australia, but indigenous people, period. Let's take, for example, what are referred to as Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal, the, the, the archaeologists never found a community of these beings. For example, Peking, they found only a few skulls. They've never found a full body in the Peking area, right? China. And then they gave these names. There's no proof scientifically that we are directly related to cavemen. No proof. No artifactual proof, no genetic proof, no DNA proof. Our DNA is similar to monkeys, that that does not mean that we came from a monkey, right? And what DNA they could extract from these skulls is very little, you know, and I know even isotopic test proof consistent. Carbon-14 is sketchy. Nonetheless, church teaching is the truth when it's doctrine, when it's dogma. You can't skirt around that. So Pope Pius XII made that statement, dogma, doctrinal statement. Adam and Eve were the first human individuals to exist. Human, key word. So no humans existed before them. You can't you can work around that. This is corroborated also in scriptures by so many other church teachings and statements and also um, prophetic revelations approved by the church. So, okay. Now we've heard from multiple exorcists before about people making so-called contracts with the devil. And especially considering our society today are somehow more fascinated by the occult witchcraft, and so on, is it any wonder why we're seeing people actively engaging and dabbling with the occult? In my ministry as an exorcist, I found that there are a number of people who say, I've made a contract with Satan and, and didn't. And there are actually a number of people who don't realize it, but they did. For example, uh, those with major mental illnesses, uh, thought disorders, uh, oftentimes they'll say to me, oh, I made a contract with Satan. But actually, they didn't. It's uh, sadly, it's part of their uh, mental disorder, uh, their thought disorder, schizophrenia, whatever. Or the scrupulous. They might have had an errant uh, uh, negative thought, and they get scrupulous. And they say, oh, I made a contract with Satan. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. So be at peace. But those who do make a contract with Satan, those who uh, throw curses, uh, cast spells, they may not realize it, but they're asking for something. They're trying to do something spiritually. They're not asking God for this. Where does it come from? It's a contract with Satan. And he may give you, uh, short term, a little something, but in the end, he'll take a lot more back from you. Anyway, for those of us who are struggling with something, perhaps alcoholism, pornography, gambling, and so on, I thought there's something that Father Vincent Lampert is saying here is so powerful and serves as a very good reminder for us all. Yeah, I think when it comes to Christ, you know, Christ has given us new life. And then the devil is really all about death and destruction. You, again, you think of the, the fall of Adam and Eve. You know, the devil said, you know, certainly you will not die. You will become like God. But he's a liar, the father of all lies, the scripture tells us, because death entered into the world. You know, Jesus came so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. The devil really is all about death and destruction. Because the human person, again, being God's greatest creation, the devil really is all about non-creation. He wants to destroy everything. So when you think of the devil, you think of words that we've been talking about, death, destruction, isolation. When it comes to sexual sins, they're always in isolation. You know, people may get caught up in pornography on the internet, and they think, well, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm by myself. I'm in my room. No one's getting hurt along the way. But what's happening, and I think this is how the devil subtly works, is that he's impacting our ability to really think clearly. So again, he wants us to believe that sin is actually a good. You know, one of the entry points for the demonic into people's lives is habitual sin. 
where people no longer can call sin a sin. Oh, I said, okay, relax, please. Sex can be just about two people right there in the moment. You know, if he wants to see me again, he can call. And if not, that's fine, too. You know, faith in God will lead us in one direction and the faith of God in another. You know, we're living in a time when pornography is rampant, I would say. But we're also living in a time when faith is in decline. And I think there's a corollary between those two. Because when people convince ourselves that we don't need God, then there really is no consequence for the choices that we make. So people that get caught up in sexual sins will say, well, I'm not really hurting anybody along the way. But in reality, we are because we're treating that human person that we're viewing as just an object for our own gratification. We're failing to see that person as a reflection of the image of God, you know, you're looking at these images on the internet and you have to think to yourself, wait a minute, this is a child of God. This is someone that, you know, a mother gave birth to. But then again, we're treating them as nothing more than an object that can be viewed and then discarded. You know, to me, all attacks against human life have a common thread. So whether it's pornography, human trafficking, whether it's abortion and abuse, it's relegating the human person to nothing more than an object. And really, that's what the devil is all about, that the human life really is nothing. No, there's no difference between a human person and an animal. So remove God from the equation. You know, when you read the book of Revelation, you know, the book, the, the, uh, the mark of the beast is 666. Now, six is considered to be an imperfect number. What did God create on the sixth day of creation? Humans and animals. What separates humans from animals? We can live for the seventh day, meaning we can choose to honor and glorify God and give him his rightful place in our lives. But if we choose to live on the sixth day by kicking God out of our lives, not giving God the rightful pl place, then we're no different than the animals, if you will. But I think that's why, even why the devil, when he possesses someone, you know, the uh, manifestations we see are always animalistic in nature, you know, the howling and screaming and eyes rolled in the back of the head and foaming at the mouth. It really is making a mockery of the human person. Well, that is all for the video this time. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video, and hopefully all of you have learned a lot from this. Remember, if there's any feedback or suggestion, please don't hesitate to let me know in the comments below. Anyway, for those of you who'd like to support our works, I left a link to our PayPal donation in the description box below and from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for your continuous support, contribution, and prayer. Well then, until the next one, stay safe, stay healthy, and God bless you. It is important to remember that when we do these prayers, outside of Mass, we always say Amen at the end of them. You never notice that? Whereas during the Mass, we don't. During the Mass, when we say the Our Father, we don't say Amen. Why? Because the Mass is one continuous prayer to God. Now, there is a great Amen that's said at the end of the Eucharistic Canon, the Eucharistic prayers, because that is the end of the Eucharistic Canon. The Mass is made up of four parts, which is the Introduction, penitential rite, the first part. Then the readings, the second, the third, the Eucharistic canon, where the consecration is done, and the fourth, the final blessing and dismissal. And it is after the prayers of the Eucharist that only then is the Amen said, not after the Our Father of the Mass. Remember that, because oftentimes when we do prayers in public, people tend to drop the Amen after the Our Father, Hail Marys and Glory Bees, but it should be retained outside of the Mass always. Now, after this, Mary has us do an exclamation for this 25th day of the month of May, which is, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, take me with you to live in the kingdom of the will of God. Amen.